Mr. Taman, in 1992, you were charged under the Official Secrets Act for being implicated with leaking figures to the Business Times. You pleaded not guilty and you fought the case, but was fined for breaching um, the OSA. During this period, you know, between 1992 to 1994, um, is it considered a low point in your life? Well, it was a strange episode, let me put it that way. First, I believed then, as I believed all along, that if there are leaks of official secrets, we have to take action, have an investigation and let the law take its course, including prosecuting people in court if need be. I believed it then and I said so. Um, they got the wrong man. Put simply, uh, the prosecution knew that an official figure had been leaked. They knew who it got to. They needed to find a source. It would have been more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult for them to prosecute those who received or used the information without also being able to prosecute someone who was a source. Uh, the whole case started off with me being a source and charged with communicating that figure. And communication means you're intentionally communicating. Of course, I pleaded not guilty because I knew I did nothing of the sort. And the case fell through. The it was a long case. We spent a year and a half in, in court, you know. Not continually, but it stretched over that period. And the prosecution case fell flat because there was absolutely no evidence of me communicating anything. To the credit, by the way, of the Attorney General at the time, Mr. Chan Seng Kyong, um, whom I regard as a person of high integrity, late in the prosecution's case, uh, he stood up in court. He was personally in court, leading the prosecution, by the way, the Attorney General himself. Um, and he stood up in court and told the judge that if the court decides that there's no case against the first defendant, who was myself, the prosecution will be willing to proceed without me. He actually told the court, and I, I respect him for that, because he realized as the case proceeded that there was no case against me on communication. The prosecution did not ask for a new charge to be introduced, which was a lesser charge of negligence in how you handle your papers at a meeting. Uh, but the judge decided on his own to introduce it. And so the case carried on. And there too, I pleaded not guilty because there was never any evidence that the figure was actually cited at this meeting that I was at between a group of private sector economists and me and my colleague. There was never any evidence. It was an inference. I was the only one of the five defendants who took to the witness stand to defend myself. The other four opted, as they, was their right, not to take to the witness stand. I insisted on doing so. And I defended myself over a few days, answered all questions, and explained my position because I knew I wasn't guilty. Eventually, the court decided nevertheless to uh, find me guilty of this charge of mishandling my documents uh, and fine me $1,500. The others were fined $2,000. So be it. But what was very interesting for me was this. There were people very senior in the system who supported me right through. And they all told me, fight it to the end. Fight it to the end. The MAS could have easily interdicted me. There I was, a senior official in MAS. I was the director of the economics department, basically the chief economist. They could have easily interdicted me, put me on leave. They didn't. I continued to work at the MAS all the way through, all the way through. In fact, there were even board meetings where I would be there giving the presentations, and Mr. Chan se -kyung, the Attorney General, was a member of our board on the other side. They never suspended me for a, for a day. They gave me time off to attend, go to court. And then in the middle of the case, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, then senior minister, was asked by the Prime Minister of Pakistan to visit, make an assessment of Pakistan's challenges, and provide advice to Pakistan. And he asked me to come with him to assist in make, doing the analysis and in drafting a report. So it was a strange case, but my integrity was never in doubt. I do not think I was right to eventually be found guilty of that charge of negligence because there's no evidence. 
And I'll tell you something very interesting there, because this is not just my opinion. The case of negligence was that I had uh, papers with me, which I never denied, which had the figure on the papers. And across the table, the private sector economists could have cited it. That was the case for negligence. So the prosecution actually brought the table into the courtroom. It was a wonderful moment. The same table was brought into the courtroom. It had been kept all the while, taken out of MAS and kept all the while. And there, lo and behold, we had the table in the courtroom. And the prosecution witness was asked to come and sit at one end. And the same paper I had was put at the other end where I was sitting. And they asked her, what do you see? And she said, she cannot see the figure. So the inference was not even backed by the evidence. So that, that was it. It was a very strange case. There was no evidence against me, but I held nothing against the system because no one was trying to get me. No one was trying to get me. And I felt that the OSA was important. When there's a breach of the OSA, we should take action. They just got the wrong man. The OSA case didn't actually involve a psychological setback for me. But I must say the person who took the brunt of it was my wife. I had two excellent lawyers. One, Shalva Ratnam Raja, um, and second, my wife, who was assisting him. But what was interesting was this, that because the case stretched over such a long period, at the start of the case, she had just given birth to our second child, and she was nursing him, breastfeeding him. It was honestly quite a um, uh, difficult time for us at home because we had just given birth, she had just given birth to our second child. But then uh, she became expectant again during the case, and <laughs> she was heavily pregnant because it's one and a half years, she's very heavily pregnant towards the end. She was actually carrying out her child and coming to court every day. Someone had to help her with the files and so on, of course. And we had to, I remember, request for a postponement of one of the hearings uh, so that she could deliver. Fortunately, the court agreed. And we would uh, be going every day to the lawyer's office carrying this lovely rattan basket. I think they still have these lovely rattan baskets for, for babies. The newborn baby would be coming in and out of the lawyer's office every day and being placed in the lawyer's office while we're having all our serious discussions. I remember Jane made this quip to um, the reporters because the case was taking so long uh, about how she wasn't sure who was going to deliver the first, the judge or her. As it, as it happened, she delivered first. But it was a tough time for Jane. 